welcome everyone, both to the people in the room and the people joining us online, to this um, UK-Danish health dialogue on inflammatory bowel disease and health data infrastructures. We're really happy that you could all join us. My name is Anne Laugesen. I am part of the UK Science and Innovation Network based here at the Embassy in Copenhagen. Um, in the interest of keeping the flow of all the nice talks that we will hear today, we will ask that you keep questions to a sort of joint Q&A session in the end. Um, and with that, I will hand over to our Deputy Ambassador, Sarah Riley, who will give opening remarks for today. Um, welcome everybody to the British Embassy this beautiful sunny afternoon here in Copenhagen. Welcome to those in the room and also to uh, those who are joining us uh, online for the live stream. I am told by our hospitality manager that this is the first event that she has ever seen where we've had a 100% turnout of, of those who've accepted, which I think is just um, a testament to the importance of this issue. Um, we're really pleased to host you here today for this health dialogue on inflammatory bowel disease and health data infrastructures. I know the UK and Denmark have a really strong partnership and a fruitful ongoing dialogue on different health-related issues, and that ranges from the close cooperation that we saw during COVID-19 to knowledge exchange on mental health issues. We share so many uh, similarities in our approach to tackling health care and biomedical research. And our experience shows over many years that there's so much that we can learn from each other. I know that today we have two aims. The first to put a spotlight on inflammatory bowel disease, a common, often debilitating disease which is on the rise worldwide, by highlighting how the disease affects individuals and society and focusing on Danish, British and joint research initiatives, we hope to raise awareness and highlight synergies and challenges for increased collaboration. Secondly, we hope to contribute to the careful consideration going on in both our countries on how best to optimise the use of our excellent healthcare data resources, health data resources. Um, and how to in integrate molecular analyses with clinical data is a major challenge. And the development of precision medicine through better use of health data is a key priority for the governments and healthcare systems in both our countries. And by exploring the ongoing work to establish the necessary infrastructures, we hope to facilitate increased knowledge exchange to support our goals. I know we've got a fantastic range of expert speakers here um, with us today. They're going to talk around this, uh, uh, on this issue on a, uh, from a range of perspectives, from a, on a range of uh, angles. Um, we have Emma Holton, economist and feminist activist, Professor Charlie Lees from Edinburgh University, Professor Tina Jess from the PREDICT Centre of Excellent Olborg University, Dr. Carl Anderson from the Wellcome Sanger Institute, and Rebecca Cosgriff, who's Head of Strategy, Data for Research and Development in NHS England. I'm really grateful to all of those speakers for joining us today to raise awareness of this important common disease. And by highlighting our ongoing national and collaborative efforts to harness the power of our health data, to the benefit of IBD patients and across disease areas, we hope to identify shared challenges and synergies where we might benefit from even closer co collaboration. I'm sure today's gonna make an am amazing contribution um, to this important area. And thank you again to everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so one thing we talked about when setting up this event that was that we would really like to include people from different sectors to really get perspectives from across academia, clinicians, industry, policy makers, everyone. And one voice that is sometimes forgotten in that is the patients living with the disease. So we were really happy that Emma Holton, uh, who happens to be a patient living with inflammatory bowel disease, agreed to come and talk to us. Unfortunately, as some of you might have seen a second ago, she had to run to catch a train for another engagement, but she came by the embassy earlier today and filmed her contribution, which we will now watch together. Hello, my name
my name is Emma Holton. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm a bit nervous. I have spoken a lot in public, but not so much about my illness. So this is also a new thing for me. Uh, it has to be in this format because I'm busy today, so I'll just have to like imagine your uproarious laughter at my jokes. Um, but very pleased to be here and to be able to speak to you all. So the reason that I'm here today is that in 2017, I had for two years been struggling with fatigue, bad sleep, um, stomach aches, and bloody diarrhea. And now I know that in the hospital they call it stool, but I didn't know that back then. I'd been to multiple doctors and they'd said to me, you know, you seem a little bit stressed. You know, many young women today are very stressed out. Maybe you shouldn't be such a perfectionist. Um, but at the third doctor I visited uh, after the two years of these issues said to me, um, I think we should do a test. And I think you might be suffering from an autoimmune illness. Um, I've never heard this word before, it was news to me. Um, but I was then, in the fall of 17, diagnosed with what is called ulcerative colitis, which I usually say to people, it's like Crohn's, but only here and not here. Um, it's an autoimmune, autoimmune uh, disease of the bowels. Um, and, you know, in many ways I live an exceedingly verbal life, um, but uh, I actually struggle with putting into words what it means to me uh, to be sick. Um, I think even though I have uh, had this illness now for quite a few years, I still have difficulty putting it into words. Um, and I think it has something to do with how we talk about illness. It seems to many people that in our society, illness is, in, is a binary state. Either you're ill or you're healthy. Um, and when you're living with an autoimmune illness, it's not really like that. When I'm in remission or I'm not like having a blowout or a flare up of my illness, I can do a lot of things. I can drink alcohol. I can eat pretty much whatever I want. Um, but when I'm sick, I'm really sick. Um, and the last time I was really sick was in 2019. I was hospitalized for a week, so I can get really sick. And I think we have um, a job market, especially, that really affects chronically ill people because there is this idea that either you're too sick to work or you're healthy. But I'm not either of those things. I have to constantly be in a dialogue, dialogue with my illness and try to figure out, okay, what am I, ca what am I capable of today? What would push me over the edge? Um, and I think... Um, for many chronically ill people, and certainly for me, this idea of not being a productive member of society, of not feeling that I can contribute enough or that I'm somehow a burden on others has really taken a toll on my mental health in terms of being sick. I think we have a very reductive way of perceiving who's valuable and who's not. That's basically only kind of tied up to the idea of like how much are we contributing in tax. But people who are ill, we contribute a lot. Um, I certainly feel that we have insight into a state of living that's maybe difficult but also gives us an understanding of other people who are suffering other people who are in dire straits tend to come to us to speak about their suffering because they know that we understand what it's like to be in society but not really fit in and i think we have a tendency to think that society becomes more and more inclusive and more and more progressive as time goes on but I think with illness, that's not necessarily the case. Um, if you look at something like the blind in Denmark, in 1961, 66% of the blind in Denmark were employed, and today it's only 2%. So I think in some ways, um, the way we've like cast the labor market has actually made it a little bit less flexible because I can contribute I can do a lot like I can when I can have weeks where I can work a lot but then there'll be weeks in my life where I'm just completely passive and I can do nothing and that's just difficult to square with the way that we've structured society and that's really a struggle for many young people who are living with chronic illness or a handicap we do want to contribute but the ways that we can do it are very very limited and I think that that really goes to show that there's also always a relationship for me between the somatic and the psychosomatic or the psychological. For me, of course, my illness is a somatic state. Um, I'm physically sick in my body, but it's very related to my mental state as well. I didn't know this at the time um, when I started uh, getting my diagnosis and understanding my illness. But um, a Canadian study has showed that people suffering with ulcer ulcerative colitis are twice as likely to have been victims of sexual violence in their youth or childhood. And I think we have a tendency to have some really siloed off understandings, like either you're psychiatrically sick or you're somatically sick. 
But for me, there is a huge relationship between, you know, my stress levels and the way my illness is responding, but also the other way around. When I'm sick, I uh, have increased anxiety, I sleep terribly, I get much more worried. Um, I even have some, I've had issues with depressive episodes when I'm sick. So there is like this extremely uh, complex relationship between my psychiatric health and my somatic health. And I think sometimes when treating uh, people like me, uh, I know we're going to be talking about probably the healthcare system today and our way of diagnosis, our way, the way that we live our lives. I think, um, and I don't want to be too critical, but sometimes we tend to isolate uh, the somatic and forget the psychosomatic uh, relationship that it has. For example, uh, the first time I had a serious flare-up, um, I was given a type of medicine that probably many of you uh, will know, uh, prednisone, um, which is binyabarkhormon in Danish. Um, and I didn't know what this was, like I didn't had no idea. Um, and a week after I started taking it, my head started swelling up. I wasn't eating at all. Um, I wasn't sleeping um, and I was extremely, extremely anxious. And I called um, my doctor and I was like, I think there's something wrong with this medicine. I think I might be reacting negatively to it. Um, and he's like, no, no, that's just like the regular thing. You know, that's just how it is. And I think for him, he thought that like my bowels is his job. Like if I don't, I'm not bleeding, if I don't have any sores, like he did his job. But actually he made me more sick. I know it can sound absurd, but I'd rather have diarrhea than anxiety to be quite honest. And I think I would have liked maybe to be included much more in understanding like what is the, what is the effect gonna be on me and actually what is it that makes me live my life in the best way? How can we make me have a life that is as normal as possible? And I think I spoke about sexual violence earlier, um, and I think I got really interested in this statistic uh, about the relationship, which is like still fickle, it needs much more research, but between sexual trauma and ulcerative colitis, because I was a victim of a digital sexual assault, what, what we then called revenge porn in 2011, uh, which was a hugely traumatic um, thing for me, but also something that I ended up uh, making, doing activism about, and that's been my work for many years. And I think it's interesting, because I do see some similarities in illness and being subjected to sexual violence, especially in how you're met by society. Because I think what, categori what um, characterizes sexual violence and illness is this sense that there's a loss of control. And I think there is a perception in our society by people who ha are so lucky that they haven't had these experiences, they think that they can control every aspect of their life. So they live in this illusion that they would never get sick, they would never be subjected to rape or sexual violence, it would never happen to them because they're smart, they're taking their precautions. And I think this really increases the isolation that sick people feel, because when we talk to other people about our illness, we're met with people trying to fix us or turning away from us because they don't really want to be confronted by the fact that we just got sick and there's really nothing we can do about it. So they'll always try to give us these tips like, have you tried smoothies? Have you tried hot yoga? Have you tried like not eating for 50 years? And I think it is a way for them to attempt to gain control of the situation. They simply cannot be in it and rest with me in the fact that I'm sick and there's really nothing I can do. So people really do turn away from you. And I think the poet Caspar Eric, who writes about living with a disability, says it really well. He says that, I'm not fighting with my disability, I'm fighting with the world because I love it. And I think I feel the same way about being ill. Um, I can deal with my illness, there are loads of things I can do, I can be with the people I love, I can have a glass of wine with the people I care about, I can work, but there's also things I can't do. But the things I can't do become a problem because of the way people talk about it, because of the way people perceive me. I can do loads of things, but the perception of me is really an issue of what it means to be sick. And I think we have, and I think maybe that's also why um, I'm struggling to find the words sometimes, because we have so, we're so bad at verbalizing a loss of control and being in the world while living in a situation that you can't always control. Um, and I think people, they want to think that this could never happen to them. It makes them extremely uncomfortable. And I think that's what really like m fuses the experiences that I've had with sexu sexual violence and illness. It makes people extremely uncomfortable to talk about illness or loss of control or being subjected to something that people want to think could never happen to them. 
Um, so there is like, you feel like being a walking taboo in a way. And I think especially for people now, I'm 31, especially when I talk to chronically ill people who are in their 20s or early 20s or, or teens, I think this taboo, this lack of language really is something that shapes their everyday. And I think last but not least, um, I want to just connect a little bit of a, a thought to the idea of the natural life. I think both in the chronically ill community, but also certainly in kind of the world at large, we have this dream that natural is better, that living a life where you're not on medicine, where you're fixing everything through yoga and eating and diet, that's like the hierarchically more beautiful and pure life. And I just want to say, I won't swear in the embassy, but I, be I don't believe that. That's not true to me. Um, I think it's really been an important barrier for me to get over to say, you know, you know what, being on acetylprene, being on immunosuppressants really has increased my quality of life tremendously. I haven't had a flare up since 2019. I go to Roskilde Festival, I travel, I do all these things despite being ill. And I constantly am met with this idea, oh, wouldn't you like to be not on medicine? And I'm like, no, I would like to live a good and happy life. And I think um, the idea that the natural body, the unmedicated body is a superior body, a more beautiful body, is really something that I'm trying to fight, not only in society, but also um, within myself. Um, and I think I'm growing to love my body the way it is. Uh, it needs some help doing things, but I think, you know, um, we all need help sometimes. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. We, that was, oh, sorry, I think I lost. Yeah, good, we're on. We will move on to the next speaker, who is Charlie Lees. Charlie is a professor of gastroenterology and a consultant gastroenterologist in Edinburgh, currently on sabbatical in Copenhagen. Over to you, Charlie. <laughs> Well, thank you, Anne, and um, thank you, Emma, for that really wonderful and very powerful story, very thoughtful as well, actually. And so I'm a gastroenterologist. I work in Edinburgh, um, both at the hospital there, looking after a large clinic of people with inflammatory bowel disease, many of whom I've looked after for the last 20 years, and I hope to look after for many more years, but also at the university researching into the causes and the consequences of these chronic illnesses. And I think Emma has really illustrated the chronic and debilitating, debilitating nature of inflammatory bowel disease. So I'm going to give just a little bit of overview um, about IBD, um, the impact on the individual, the impact globally, touching on who gets IBD and why, and some practical implications for today to set the scene for um, the rest of the conversation. So as a gastroenterologist, we're interested in the gut, and there are many things occurring within the gut that are really central to many illnesses. And when we start to zoom in on this, we can see that we have this layer of epithelial cells across the whole of our gut that separate these billions of bacteria from our immune system. And it's within inflammatory bowel disease that this seems to go awry. So we're talking about Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. Emma's talked about ulcerative colitis, which accounts for just over a half, um, and Crohn's disease, which is about 40%. So this chronic bowel inflammation, where there is a dysregulated mucosal immune system, an altered microbiome, which we call a dysbiosis, and very powerful environmental and genetic drivers. Emma's described the sort of relapsing and remitting and unpredictable nature for some people, these illnesses progress over time, and we see that very much with Crohn's disease. And a need for, in most people, chronic regular medication to maintain good health, and all too frequently, surgical intervention. And where we're at right now in 2023 is we have many unanswered questions and really still an urgent unmet need. So for the individual, we see physical aspects, pain, diarrhea, often with blood, often with urgency, sometimes with incontinence. 
we see an illness that affects not just the gut, but the joints, the skin, the mouth, the eyes, and the brain. We see systemic illness, night sweats, fevers, sickness, unable to eat, weight loss. We see a very profound psychological component from fatigue to mental exhaustion, anxiety and depression. We know there are long-term complications of the disease. It might be hospitalizations for flare, like Emma described. It might be surgical interventions where portions of the intestines are removed, often with a stoma formed where these, um, the intestines are exteriorized and the contents into a bag on the skin. But it's impact on everyday life that Emma's brought life to. So might be more time in the bathroom, impact on studies and work, including absence and choice of job, relationships, sex life, family planning, pregnancy, food choices, restricted to manage or avoid a flare. So who gets IBD and why? Well, the answer is anyone can get IBD. We typically see it in young people, but it can occur at any age, roughly equal male and female split. And we know when you take into account all, all, all other factors, like environment and geography, it affects people um, of all ethnicities in all parts of the world. Um, and this is something that we should take into consideration. So first described in the UK and North America as Crohn's disease at the first part of the 20th century, we saw um, the rate going up and up and up as the Western world industrialized and really something that's now a very global phenomenon, which I can show you perhaps very neatly here, which depicts the four stages of the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease. And where we are in Denmark and in the United Kingdom, we're at this phase, where actually the instance, the number of people that get IBD is roughly stable and has been for probably about a decade. But because we diagnose people when they are young, and because thankfully there is no obvious excess mortality, or if there is, it's very, very limited, the prevalence is going up and up. And we've looked at this in our population in Edinburgh, in the Scottish population. We calculated five years ago that one in every 125 people are currently living with inflammatory bowel disease. And we know that by 2028 that will have exceeded 1%. So that's twice as common as diabetes, type 1 diabetes. This is a big problem. And this very much mirrors what we've seen from um, Tina's data here in Denmark and elsewhere. But if we really think globally, and where the, the large number of people are gonna be in the world, we can look at this acceleration phase that's occurring in huge populations like the Indian subcontinent and China. And we can look even more to the African continent, look at the big populations like you see in Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan and in Nigeria. And if you look out to see where the population of the world is going to be in the next 50 to 100 years. It's not Europe. The European population actually shrinks. The Asian population grows a bit, but then stays stable. But the growth in Africa. So this is a really important global issue. And if we can understand causes now and start to get to prevention, then actually we can offset a world of misery, quite literally, moving forward. We recognize, I think, inflammatory bowel disease as an illness of modern living. The clearest epidemiological signal is urbanization. And if you look at the UN data, 2007 was the pivot point where the number of people living in urban populations exceeded the number of people living in rural populations worldwide for the first time. And that trend is only going in one direction. And so if we think about what causes IBD, we have environmental shifts that are very pronounced. We have a genetic background that Carl's going to talk to a bit more soon. And we have this altered microbiome, which appears to mediate what's happening. So you have modern living, the impact that I'll talk about in a minute, impacting the gut microbiome, and this genetic background that in part has been shaped by dealing with um, pathogens and plagues over millennia of human history. I'm not going to talk about the microbiome, but this is a really interesting area. It's a massive area for growth, for trying to work out 
um, therapeutic agents that you can use to target and reset the microbiome, and there's a lot that we need to unpack and unpick there. But the environment that we live in is something that clearly has changed a lot in the last 100, 200 years. Everything from diet to industrial pollution, food additives, hygiene, antibiotics, surgery, smoking, stress, exercise, sunlight exposure. And one of the things I've been very interested in, and there's a big interest here, is looking at the dietary components in IBD, about what causes IBD, and also looking then to see if dietary factors influence the course of the disease moving forwards. And one of the commonest questions that patients come to the clinic with when they ask me is, doctor, what should I eat? What should I do? Because people know that what they eat has an impact on their illness themselves. And these are some of the factors that we now have really quite good evidence for around the onset of IBD. But it's really important to note that many people eat a very, very good diet and get IBD regardless. So it's just part of actually a very complicated puzzle. And working with very large data sets where we can control for multiple other factors, we can start to piece this puzzle together. From a clinical perspective, with a patient in front of us, particularly a newly diagnosed patient today with our toolkit, what we're trying to do is actually get as close to healing as possible. And I put this up to show you that this is a two, really two-fold approach. First, if you go from bottom up, it's the conventional medical approach to heal the inflammatory process in the gut. But just as importantly, we recognize the psychosocial issues. So we're also looking, trying to get tight control of the psychological issues so that we can have a holistic viewpoint to how we improve patients. So yes, we want to treat the symptoms. Yes, we want to control the gut inflammation. We want to minimize steroid exposure. And Emma gave a very vivid example of what patients will experience there. We want to keep our patient out of hospital. We want to prevent the disease from progressing. We want to decrease surgery and stoma formation and minimize the complications from my drug and disease and try and get people back to a normal quality of life with minimal disability present. And thankfully now, we have a really fantastic drug toolkit. And if you look at this timeline, it's very concentrated into recent years. There is a great shift happening. And in the clinic, I see the impact of these new medicines making a really big difference. And many of these new medicines have come from the big, careful work that's been going on through immunological studies, through genetic studies, through big, well-powered epidemiological studies that are really starting to bear fruit. So I'm going to leave you, leave you with the sort of unmet need of where we are at and the things that we really need to try and do. We must continue to raise awareness for patients wherever they are. We need to ensure equity of care for people wherever they are globally. We need to do better treatment-wise, and this is in multiple domains with newer therapies, better therapies, better access to therapies, combinations of therapies, dietary, microbial therapies, etc. And there's some really interesting work going on in multiple strands here. We need better monitoring systems for patients. We need to be able to work out how we can stratify our patients so we can deliver personalized or precision medicine, depending to get the right drug to the right person at the right time the holistic remission piece I talked about. And then finally, this big picture that places like PREDICT here in Copenhagen with the incredible work that Tina and her team have done to deliver on is, can we get close enough to the causes of these diseases to really actually look at how we can prevent them? And that would be amazing, not just for the people living in Denmark and in the UK, but for the world's population. And I think we have a real imperative and a mission to be able to achieve this. And thank you for your attention, because I think this is a great opportunity to help spread that mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. So, the next speaker of the day will be Tina Yes. Uh, Tina is a professor and medical doctor, head of
PREDICT, Center for Molecular Prediction of Inflammatory Bowel Disease, which is part of Olbo University, but located here in Copenhagen. Tina, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you so much. I'm extremely honored to be here and pleased that the embassy prioritizes to, to help us spread the message about IBD, which is so important, as Charlie just said, to uh, create more focus on. I'm here to tell you a bit about what we're doing in Denmark in the moment. So how can we harness the power of the wonderful Danish data resources that we have and then we often talk about. I have written Making the Impossible a Reality uh, and that's because we talk a lot about our resources but I think no one has really brought them into play to the extent that we can. So if you uh, consider the Danish population, we are, well it depends on how you count, uh, more than 6 million people, maybe a bit less, but in our registries nationwide that dates back to the 70s, we are actually 8 to 9 million people. We have a healthcare system uh, seeing everyone in the country when needed, so it's free and it's easy accessible, uh, and that's quite unique worldwide, combined with the fact that we have a personal identification number that can identify all of us. So imagine that you are in another country where you only see patients who has a certain health insurance uh, or go to a certain hospital, uh, maybe because other hospitals could not treat them well. Well, then you get to study very selected subsets of patients. And that's very difficult then to generalize to the average uh, patient. So in Denmark, we have the unique opportunity to identify everyone with a given disease. And in PREDICT, uh, we study inflammatory bowel diseases. We have more than 50,000 individuals living with inflammatory bowel disease in Denmark. You just heard from Emma how tough it can be to live with these diseases. And you heard from Charlie that they are even more common than uh, diabetes. So it is extremely important to create awareness of the diseases. What can we then do in Denmark with our data? Well, there are lots of opportunities. First of all, we would often like to know the family history of patients because IBDs are to some extent um, inherited in families. So if you look at the Danish population, we are actually able to create a pedigree of the entire population via, via our personal identification number. That means that we can study the risk of disease in families. In this study, from 2015, we studied the risk of inflammatory bowel disease uh, in patients with a family member um, with IBD. And what we see from this a bit busy slide, slide is that if you have a family member with Crohn's disease uh, and it's a twin, then your own risk of uh, Crohn's disease is increased 50-fold. If you have a first-degree first family member with Crohn's disease, your risk is increased seven-fold. It doesn't matter whether it's your mother or your dad or your sibling, and so on. And even if you have a third degree relative with Crohn's disease, your risk is increased. Still, overall, we only see uh, that approximately 10% of patients have a, a family member with IBD. So that means that environment definitely also plays a part here. If we then would like to study environment and, for example, causes of disease, there are many ways to do this. One is to look into drugs that may affect the risk of disease. So there is a hypothesis that treating people with antibiotics may change their gut microbiome and hence the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. In Denmark, we have prescription data for the entire population dating back to 1995, and we can use these data for a lot of things. In this study that we published in this very month, uh, we show that antibiotic use uh, clearly increases the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. There were already data out there suggesting that antibiotic use in childhood may increase the risk, but we saw that this is actually the case across all ages. 
the things we can do in Denmark uh, are so highly valued internationally that you can see God, uh, which is a British medical journal uh, that published our study, actually chose to put uh, a very specific part from Denmark <laughs> on the cover. Uh, and we are, of course, very happy for that. But we can also do other things with our wonderful data. So once uh, a disease is diagnosed and we're going to treat it, then the treatments that we have um, are based on phase one, two and three trials in the industry. But when you include patients in these trials, even in phase three trials, there are a lot of limitations. So you do not include children or pregnant women or elderly or someone with another disease or with other treatments at the same time. And that actually means that once drugs are on the market and are given to real people in real life, you don't know the true effect and you do not know the long-term consequences. This study is back from 2014 when FDA in the US had announced that they were concerned uh, that there was an increased risk of cancer following treatment with TNF-alpha inhibitors for IBD. So we did a nationwide study, uh, studying everyone in the country who has received these drugs, compared them to other patients uh, that were comparable <laughs> in terms of disease severity, etc. And we found that actually treatment with these uh, TNF-alpha antagonists did not increase the risk of cancer. This is extremely important knowledge that is used by clinicians worldwide. Then back in 2011, we opened the Danish National Biobank. And the idea and the vision with this biobank was that, well, we have this wealth of health data in Denmark that is really unique worldwide. And, uh, but we also have a lot of biospecimens. We do blood sampling at hospitals, etc., And all these things are just basically wasted once we have done our analysis. So the Danish National Biobank was established um, as a repository for leftover samples from hospitals and research projects. And today the Danish National Biobank contains more than 12 million samples. That provides really unique opportunities. And that leads us to predict our National Center of Excellence, uh, where we study the occurrence of inflammatory bowel disease and the cause of diseases. So as we have heard, um, diseases occur at a given point in life. It, it is normally in young adulthood, but it can be in early childhood and among elderly. Normally, it's around 30 years of age when you get the diagnosis, and we have more than 50,000 individuals living with the diseases in Denmark, as you heard. Worldwide, there is a lack of knowledge of why the diseases occur. We have heard different um, suggestions from Charlie Lee's, which are, of course, world-based suggestions, but still the challenge that we have worldwide is that if you ask people what happened when you were a kid, did you have these diseases, did you get these medications, were you vaccinated, vaccinated for this, people cannot remember. So that is really... A, a challenge to a lot of studies in why diseases occur. At the same time, we first know our patients when they are in the clinic. That's when we can take blood samples, etc. But that also means that we do not know what happens biologically before the diseases are diagnosed. And that makes it extremely difficult to study development of disease. In Denmark, we have unique data, as I've already shown you, partly to describe the cause of diseases. So we can describe that IBD is a disease that varies over time in the individual patient and varies between patients. We can describe what kind of medications we use, and that is very trial and error based still. We can describe how many patients undergo surgery, have a stoma, and we can also describe how many patients, and that's actually quite a lot, that develop diseases in other organs, it's up to 40%. What we cannot do, or haven't done yet at least, is to describe the biology behind this. And that means when we have a newly diagnosed patient, we have no clue as to what direction this patient will take. So the idea with our center is to take advantage of all these unique health data that we have and combine them with uh, data from biobank samples that we analyze uh, and we do a lot of um, advanced analysis uh, that I will not uh, go into details with. But really, 
if we can bring all this together, we can do things that no one else is doing worldwide in the field. So, more specifically, of course, to do this, you need a super safe place to place your data. We're using uh, the supercomputer platform at the Danish National Genome Center for our data infrastructure. Um, I can tell that just to get to set up this computer and to get access to all the wonderful things that I just mentioned, that has already taken us three years. It's not easy. It re requires a lot of ethical permissions and a lot of GDPR work, as you can imagine. What do we then already have in our infrastructure? Well, we first of all uh, have identified 10,000 individuals in the National Biobank with IBD and 10,000 controls whom we have genotyped. So we have genetics on 10,000 patients. We are also now analyzing these samples for a lot of other molecular data. Then we have medication use in our, in our data infrastructure, and it's uh, medication use at the population level, which makes it possible to understand both how medications influence disease development, but indeed also to study, for example, if you combine things, how genetics influence um, the effect of medications in patients. Then we have a diagnosis, meaning we know of course, when patients are diagnosed with IBD, but we also know all other diseases that they have, both before they develop IBD and after. We also know which procedures they undergo if they undergo surgery uh, or other kind of procedures, and we know their lab values, so when they have a blood test drawn, uh, what we measure. Hospital fires is a huge challenge in Denmark, and it's a challenge because we have five regions, and uh, the regions do not always communicate to the extent <laughs> that could be desired, which means that we do not have the same uh, hospital file systems in the five regions. So getting access to these or even making it possible to combine data from the different resources is a huge challenge. What we have decided to do is to uh, focus on one region in Denmark, so the North Denmark region, where we have uh, at right now 35 medical students actually uh, getting data from files from the 70s till, till now on the entire IBD population. Uh, ideally, uh, you would uh, do this by text mining. That is definitely something we are considering. But if we develop a text mining system for one region, we cannot use it in the next. Uh, and there are a lot of other cohorts uh, in Denmark, uh, different population cohorts, cohorts that have been collected throughout the years. Among these, uh, the Danish National Birth Cohort, uh, comprising 100,000 women and their offspring, with a lot of detailed data around birth. So as you can imagine, bringing all these resources together creates a completely unique data infrastructure that you can use for both uh, describing why diseases occur and, and at the end of the day, understanding better which treatment works and how can we create personalized medicine in this field. To do this, you do, of course, need a lot of experts. And what we have decided to do in Denmark in our center is to gather people with a lot of complementary competences. So we have immunologists, geneticists, epidemiologists, medical doctors, we have lab people, data managers, statisticians, bioinformaticians, and of course a lot of people who knows about legal stuff, because as I said before, GDPR is a big challenge here. So this is a picture of uh, some of the great people that we have on board. We really, uh, I believe strongly in diversity. I believe that to be as innovative as possible, uh, we should bring diverse people together who do not think alike. So that is uh, definitely what we're doing here. And, uh, and what we hope to accomplish with PREDICT is that we hope to increase the, increase the understanding of the etiology of IBD. Uh, we hope to uh, discover new drug targets. We also hope to disrupt disease categories. So right now, as you have heard, we divide the diseases into Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But that is probably way too simple. Uh, we do not understand why people go in so many different directions right now, and it's so difficult to find the right treatment from the beginning. It's probably due to the fact that we talk about a lot of uh, subclasses of disease that we should be much better at understanding. 
So we hope to discover the bio biology behind disease heterogeneity. Um, we also hope to discover shared biological mechanisms with other diseases. As I said, up to 40% of patients have diseases in other organs, uh, and it would be really, really interesting to understand the shared biological mechanisms with these diseases. Then we thrive for international collaborations. We already have a great attention um, around the center worldwide or internationally, so, uh, and we collaborate with uh, leading universities across the US. We indeed collaborate with people in the UK. Uh, we have the honor of having Charlie Lees visiting right now. Uh, and we collaborate also with the, the Francis Crick Institute uh, and Imperial College in London and with uh, universities across Europe. And it is indeed my mission to reach out to other parts of the world because we have to remember we are not only Europe and the US and the pool of patients is increasing worldwide and especially in Asia and Africa right now. And last but not least, we hope that this can be a state-of-the-art model for what we can do with our wonderful resources in Denmark. To my knowledge, this has not been done to this extent in uh, any other disease area in Denmark, and I really hope that we pave the way for doing this across diseases. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Tine. Our next speaker of the day is Carl Anderson, who is a senior group leader at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge, and will tell us more about the genetics of IBD. Thank you, Anne. And thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak today. It really is a huge honor to be here and to see you all. Uh, yeah, that makes around how close working between uh, the UK and Denmark for our goals, not just for IBD, but potentially for a whole plethora of different common complex diseases. So as Anne mentioned, I'm here to basically give you a brief on where we are with the genetics of IBD and understand, using genetics to identify new drug targets for the disease, understand the causal biological pathways, and to begin um, identifying which drug should be given to which patient at which point in time to give them the maximal uh, clinical benefit. So I want to start with a bit of a pitch around uh, genetics and why genetics is such an amazing um, uh, subject to study. So the genome sequence of an individual is laid down at conception and stays stable throughout life. And that really does give us that, a very powerful anchor into the causal biology of a disease. You know, if you detect an association between a genetic variant and something you're interested in, so in our case that might be IBD susceptibility, you know that its genetic variant causes IBD because IBD cannot cause a genetic variant. The germline genome is, is established at conception and remains stable throughout life. That's almost a unique position in biology. Many of the other things that we associate with disease, we don't know the direction of that causal arrow. We don't know whether the thing that you've measured causes disease or whether disease has somehow changed that thing you've measured. And genetics allows you to get around that. So genetics gives this unique ability into disease causality. And that is why we're very much interested in using it to understand disease biology. And actually, it really helps. If you have a genetic variant, which you know is associated with disease, then it massively increases the chances that if you develop a drug against that piece of biology where you have that genetic causal anchor, it hugely increases the chances that that particular drug will go on successfully through, through clinical trial. And that's what I'm showing you up in, in this, this picture here up on your, your right hand side. So there's two different types of genetic variants and genetic support for a particular target, whether it's come from sequencing, which is the, um, the top row, if it's come from sequencing of exonic variants, or in the bottom row, if it's come from a genome-wide association study, where perhaps you have to do more work to identify the particular gene that that genetic variant is affecting. But nonetheless, what you can see here is that there is at least a two and a half 
uh, fold increased chance of a particular drug successfully making it through clinical trial if you have genetic support indicating that that particular uh, gene plays a role in your particular disease. And if you think about how difficult it is to develop a drug, how costly and time consuming it is to develop a drug, if you have something which is going to increase the chances of success twofold or more, that's a very powerful thing to have in your arsenal and via genetics we can deliver that. So where are we at in terms of understanding the genetics of IBD? Well, actually, it's been a real um, uh, success story over the last, um, well, 15 years, I suppose, but even thinking right back to the very early genetic studies in the mid-90s, uh, IBD has kind of led the way. As I stand here today, there are over 240 regions of the human genome which have been significantly associated with inflammatory bowel disease susceptibility. And what, they've, what that's done is it's um, enabled us to identify very many different aspects of biology that we now know play a causal role in disease. And I'm showing you some of those here. So microbe sensing and effector pathways. Charlie touched on the role that uh, the microbiome can play in IBD. We have genetic variants that are involved in biology processes that maintain intestinal barrier integrity, adaptive immunity, inflammation and fibrosis. I won't go through the full list, but what I'll just point to is at the bottom of each one of these captions, these little figures here, you can see there's a list of gene names. And those are the genes that we've associated with IBD that sit within these pathways and give us these causal insights that the disruption of these biological processes is underpinning, uh, is underpinning uh, inflammatory bowel disease susceptibility. I'm going to pause now just to tell you a little bit about a study which we've recently undertaken where we've, where we've whole exome sequenced tens of thousands of, um, of IBD patients and controls. So just to get rid of some of the jargon here, um, you might have heard that the, the large fraction of the human genome, actually 97% of it, doesn't actually encode um, for proteins. Um, that 3% that does though is obviously very important for understanding um, disease. And so what we've done is we've sequenced all the variants that lie within that 3% of the genome that um, encodes for, for proteins. And, and um, we've, we've looked to see if we can identify variants within those coding sequences of the genome that are significantly associated with IBD risk. So what I'm showing you here uh, on the x-axis is the frequency of the genetic variant in the population. And basically we're looking at quite low frequent, rare variants that are below 5% frequency in the population. And on the y-axis, what I'm showing you is their effect on disease risk. So if we think about um, those which are above that, uh, that odds ratio of one line, those genetic variants increase risk of Crohn's disease. Those variants that are below that line significantly decrease risk of Crohn's disease. And I'm just showing you here the variants in the genes that we knew about before we undertook our study. So as I said, we sequence these coding parts of the human genome, this 3% of the human genome, um, in these 30,000 Crohn's disease cases and our 80,000 population controls, and we identified five additional um, coding variants in five uh, genes to be significantly associated with Crohn's disease risk, and I've shown you uh, the gene names here in parentheses. So this then newly implicates these genes in the biology of IBD. We also have a direction of effect for these associations. So we know whether or not these variants increase or decrease risk of disease. So that gives us uh, an insight not into which genes to target, but whether we need agonists or antagonists and things like this to, to ultimately um, deliver the therapeutic benefit that we hope to our patients. We also identified six additional um, variants and genes that were in regions of the genome that our other studies had already shown were involved in IBD susceptibility, but we were perhaps struggling to work out which of the many genes in that region were ultimately driving the disease. By finding these six coding variants that sit within actual uh, genome sequence that encodes the protein, it very neatly points us straight at the protein and gives us a very good handle on the direction of effect um, in terms of which way one needs to dial that gene in order to um, in order to have a, a beneficial effect on, on IBD susceptibility. So if we look across these genes, um, 
the biological lessons that come from this in particular kind of implicate uh, mesenchymal cells, a cell population that sit within uh, the GI tract and support um, the, the gut cells. Um, the emerging role and emerging appreciation we have that the role of mesenchymal cells play in intestinal inflammation. And actually, like all good um, studies and all good scientists, we've not only just recently published this study, we've also started working on a newer and larger version of this analysis. And so we have, in our latest version, 90,000 um, IBD cases where we've sequenced the exomes of them and um, over half a million controls. And so what we're really hoping to do is to hugely increase the number of loci, the number of regions of the human genome that we know play a role in IBD, so we can get a more complete picture of um, disease-causing biology. I've talked a lot so far about the genetics of IBD susceptibility, IBD onset. You've heard me talk a bit about comparing cases to controls. You've heard a lot, though, um, from um, every, all the speakers today, actually, about this need to understand drug response and disease progression. And we can use genetics to get at the causal biology underpinning drug response in much the same way that we can use genetics to understand disease susceptibility. I'm just going to show you the results from one study that we've uh, been working on and published um, a couple of years ago. So as, you, as you've heard, anti-TNFs are a frontline therapy um, for patients who have IBD. Um, and one of the issues with anti-TNFs is that patients can lose response to the drug over time. So they may have initially had a good response um, from anti-TNF, but over time they will lose response. And one of the reasons why that happens is because the drug is a biologic, the body's own immune system recognizes the drug as being foreign, a foreign protein, and basically mounts an immune response. You raise antibodies to the drug. And then when you raise antibodies to the drug, you start clearing the drug out of your system and you lose response. So in this study, um, which we were in collaboration with the Exeter, Research, uh, Exeter IBD Research Group, we measured the, um, the antibody titers against this drug. So we, for every patient, we went in and assayed their anti-drug antibody titer level, and we separated them into two groups, patients who had developed antibodies and patients who hadn't developed antibodies. And then we compared the, um, the genetic sequence data between those two groups, and what we found is that if you carry a particular copy of an HLA allele, so let's call it let's, HLA is a region of the, of the human genome, um, this particular gene is called HLA DQA105. If you carry this particular uh, genetic variant, then your chances of developing immunogenicity to anti TNF, the rate at which you clear um, antibodies to the drug out, the, the rate at which you clear the drug from your system, increases twofold. Right, so you will clear the drug twice as quickly if you uh, carry this variant versus if you don't. And this variant is, an, is about 30% frequency in the European population. So we're not talking about a rare variant here. It's a very profound genetic effect. So one of the ways that we're now using um, uh, growing health data resources to understand drug response in IBD is via the IBD bioresource. There's 36,000 patients within the UK um, who have um, genetic data. We've generated genetic data on them. Uh, they've also consented for recall by genotype and phenotype, consented for access to their historically collected samples. About 15,000 of those patients have been on anti-TNFs and have genetic data available. So we're um, sending out to those patients an advanced medication questionnaire to get more phenotypic data on their, on their uh, anti-TNF drug and the response to that, and then also getting secure linkage of drug monitoring data from NHS labs so we can start accessing things like the anti-drug antibody titers and generating that data where it doesn't exist. And then what that allows us to do is certainly replicate the association we've seen with the HLA DQ105, but also think through whether or not testing HLA, genotyping HLA DQ105 and using it to make clinically informed decisions, what are the health economics behind that? Would it be an effective uh, way of deciding, for example, whether patients who are given anti-TNF and carry HLA DQ105 should be put on an immunomodulator to decrease the rate at which they develop um, antibodies against the drug. We can also um, look at other drug-related phenotypes, such as um, non-response. So some pe people just never respond to anti-TNF straight off the bat. And um, we can also use it to try and identify additional regions of the genome that are associated with immunogenicity. 
And that kind of poster child really kind of serves a good example of what we're trying to do in the UK and also um, what uh, uh, Trina and colleagues are trying to do here in Denmark. And I think really speaks very nicely to how the two countries can collaborate uh, together to really um, push through this agenda of better understanding the biology of IBD and delivering on personalised medicine. So in the UK, we expect by about uh, 2026 that 10% of the UK population will have at least been genotyped genome-wide, if not uh, exome sequenced or, or, or genome sequenced via various different initiatives such as Genomes England, Our Future Health and uh, Biobank. Around the world, by that point, millions of people will have been ultimately uh, genotyped or, or sequenced. If we can bring all this together, that high resolution genetic uh, data, together with access to electronic health records, prescriptions data, lab data, lifestyle data, the type which uh, Trina and Charlie have been talking about, and we can generate uh, molecular data for defining biomarkers of response, you can see how um, we can start to understand not just the genetics of disease, but also the genetics of disease progression, the gen genetics of drug response, and all of that, um, not just, and I say just very uh, carefully here, because it would be a big thing to start identifying biomarkers for drug uh, disease progression and drug response, but then use the genetics to understand which of those biomarkers are playing a causal role in drug response progression and disease susceptibility so that we can um, develop better treatments alongside our predictive algorithms which are going to be based not just on genetics, not just on omics, not just on the environmental and patient phenotypic data but by combining all of those data sets together. So I'm going to stop there, um, thank um, everyone in my team who um, has been uh, helping us undertake this work, all of my collaborators in the UK and International IBD Genetics Consortia, the funders for our work, and uh, you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. That leads us to the last speaker before the Q&A session. Uh, Rebecca Cosgriff is the Head of Strategy for the Data and R&D Programme, Data for R&D Programme, yes, um, in the NHS Transformation Unit in the UK. Thank you, Anne, very much for organising this event and for the opportunity to speak amongst such fantastic speakers that you've already heard from today. Um, I am here, um, as Anne has said, to talk about a programme called the Data for Research and Development Programme, which is um, housed within NHS England, but is um, funded across uh, several government departments, up to £200 million um, over three years. We've just come to the end of our first year of the programme to make um, health data more accessible and linkable for research purposes. And what that really means is that we're trying to create an ecosystem of data that can satisfy the, the ask that Emma put to us at the beginning, which is to be able to look holistically at patients by bringing together mental health data with IBD data, with any kind of comorbidity information that you might need, and hopefully put us into a position where that ecosystem can rapidly and securely assemble the information that researchers like Tina, Charlie and Carl need to answer any question that they could possibly think of and remove some of the friction that we've had historically between that point of delivering security as well as rapid accessibility. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the programme came to be and some of the thinking that we've put into designing the programme. Um, it was sort of born out of a, a number of strategic documents that are pretty high profile across the UK and have synergies across some of the strategy documents that you have here in Denmark. And really to try and distill them, they kind of make calls to embed research um, more fully across the NHS, including amongst NHS workforce, to have data as a prerequisite and an enabler of research and have our research be more representative of our diverse population, as well as be something that can support life sciences innovation more generally across the UK. Um, and that put us in a position to secure that £200 million funding envelope in our last spending review. And we were in a position to announce that in March 2022, just before the programme formally launched um, that April. So as I say, we've just come to the end of our first year. And hot on the heels of our programme launch came a review called the Gold Acre Review. Um, and then subsequently the Department of Health's Data Saves Lives strategy, both of which called for secure data environments, um, which are secure analytic environments that allow for 
for research ready data to be linked together and then accessed um, to become more um, frequently used across the health data landscape, um, but also to be the vehicle to transition us away from what has been a traditional model of data sharing, so acting like a lending library where researchers need access to data, to something more akin to a reading library where we have a model of data access rather than the data having to leave that environment, which is something that was really vital for us in the UK to gain and maintain the trust and confidence of patients and the public when it comes to use of health data for research purposes. So as well as those strategic documents giving us some direction, we've also shaped the programme around six high-level research use cases. None of these types of research will be new to, to anyone um, watching or in the room, I'm sure. Um, whilst these are high level, they are all very different from one another. You might need very different data capabilities, data assets to satisfy an artificial intelligence use case to one that's more focused on something like post-market surveillance or even evaluating feasibility for a clinical trial. And one of the ways that these research use cases have guided our approach is that they've really made us realise that if we want to deliver um, that strategic goal of an ecosystem supporting all types of research by March 2025, that we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. We've got this £200 million of funding, but if we invest just in one place, it's really unlikely that over a three-year time horizon we'll be able to satisfy all of these types of research. So we've really invested in a diverse, mixed portfolio that's designed to iteratively deliver against all of these research use cases, rather than trying to have um, one secure data environment to rule them all. Um, and as well as thinking about lots of different types of research use cases, we've also thought about types of data, which is um, probably a relief for you all to hear. Um, so on the one hand, we're really prioritising gaining access to primary care or general practitioner data, which isn't available at national level um, in England at the moment, um, but also focusing on the jewel in the crown, which is multimodal data. And we do have um, really excellent um, multimodal data infrastructure in the UK, but it's not necessarily being constructed in a way that means it can be easily accessed um, in a way that's not siloed. So we're really focusing on making genetic data able to be accessed um, amongst different uh, data assets, but also doing things like making genetic data available alongside pathology data or imaging data or le electronic health record data, for example. <laughs> So as well as bringing data together, we're also trying to bring different people together because having imaging pathology and electronic health record data is not necessarily incredibly valuable if you only have one sector mm -hmm. able to access it or only one sector able to steer the type of data that is available how and when. Um, so we try and engage stakeholders across uh, multiple different groups, as you can see on the slide. That's not just so that they can hear from us and us from them, but so they can also hear from each other because there are really different requirements that get cited to us across um, small and medium-sized um, enterprises, big pharma, academics, medical research charities, and also the needs and requirements that patients and the public tell us that they have as well. Um, so we try and engage across all, all, um, all those folks. So that has led us to this, our programme on a page. This is what we are spending money on over what is next, the next two years until the programme lifetime ends. Um, on the one hand, we're investing in data-driven clinical trials. That includes a service in England called the NHS DigiTrial Service, which tries to support clinical trials really from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. So it supports feasibility assessment and site selection. And there's just um, been launched a self-service version of that tool, which more or less takes um, kind of insight generation that used to take up to five months down to literally five minutes. I've had a go. Um, it's not the prettiest tool just yet. It's still a minimum viable product, but it certainly does the job in terms of generating insights that can be really tangibly useful. It also actually sends out invitations to our patients and the public to invite them to participate in research and it, it supported an early cancer detection study called NHS Gallery to recruit over 140,000 people in just 10 months. Um, across the UK and it's currently supporting the study that Carl um, highlighted on one of his slides which is called Our Future Health and it's sent out over 10 million invitations for our citizens to participate in that study. And we're also hoping to help clinical trialists to understand who to go to for what, when and how when it comes to underpinning their clinical trials with data um, by developing both a navigation tool and a concierge service. And we're looking to empower patients and the public to proactively volunteer to participate in clinical trials. And those efforts are focused around a platform that's hosted by the National Institute for Health Research called Be Part of Research. It really does what it says on the tin, that tool. Um, give it a Google. It only takes 10 minutes to sign up. You can do it while I'm talking. Um, 
and we are underpinned by um, patient and public involvement and engagement activity as well as a, a commercial model for accessing data within this new world of secure data environments and uh, the development of a data access policy for the NHS. Um, the majority of the financial investment for the programme goes into this data access and linkage segment of the programme, um, which is essentially investment in secure data environments, whether that's existing secure data environments that hold genomics data that we're trying to federate access um, between, the National NHS England secure data environment or subnational secure data environments. And I'm going to talk more about the NHS Research Secure Data Environment or SDE network. Um, again, very much investing in a mixed portfolio because each of these data assets will deliver slightly different USPs. So the national SDE, which is on the bottom of the slide, for example, can make, give access at scale. So across the whole population of England, that's around 55 million people to um, high level, but really highly curated information which will over time include the NHS funded disease registries. It already includes the, the National Cancer Registration System, rare diseases and congenital abnormality data sets. Um, will ultimately include primary care data um, and is really suitable for um, research and epidemiology that requires huge numbers, huge volumes of, of people to be available. So, for example, evaluating the safety and efficacy of vaccines across the whole population is one of the use cases that we've had in place in that national secure data environment. Um, we're investing also in what I'm calling sub-national secure data environments. They are smaller than the national SDE, but not small. They cover an average population of around 5 million each, and they are able, because of their slightly more nimble size, to be more agile, generate access to near <coughs> real time, um, less deliberately less curated data um, and will in shorter order be able to provide access to multimodal data so that's imaging pathology genomics and electronic health record data which is really <laughs> suitable to things like AI development and validation um, and whilst each of those subnational secure data environments there are 11 teams being funded to develop these will have a core offer to be able to support all types of research all of those research use cases many of them are building on existing infrastructure so East of England for example is building building on the HDR UK funded gut reaction hub. Um, so they will have some specialism in research like IBD, for example, over and above that core offer. And I'm going to come back to genomics in a second. So this is uh, a map of England for anyone that uh, doesn't recognize it, but it really all this is to show is that the, there is some variation between the population sizes covered by the subnational secure data environment teams that we're funding, but collectively they're greater than the sum of their parts and the sum of their parts is all of England. Um, so what that means is as a network, which is very much being designed to be interoperable, so we're not creating 11 silos, they're all part of a cohesive whole unified by a community of practice that we've assembled and um, that we have coverage of all of England for this granular multimodal data. And, and just briefly, I'm going to mention two of our genomics um, driver projects. So this is how we're seeking to prove out the ability to federate um, genomics data assets, both with one another and with other types of data. So we're working with the National Pathology Imaging Collaborative and Genomics England to work with them to federate those two data assets and create a really large um, cancer data asset that's really suitable for um, training predictive AI algorithms. Mm -hmm and a second project with the University of Cambridge, which is really seeking to prove out our ability to federate between two genomics data assets. So I'm just gonna end on a few opportunities, I hope, um, for discussion. So the first one's a selfish one, uh, which is my need to prove out um, international research as a use case that can be satisfied by the investments that the data for R&D programme is making, um, both in terms of being able to support just work that happens internationally because secure data environments that can be accessed um, work incredibly well within a nation, but we need them to work across nations as well and we need to be able to shape um, how data policy supports that. Um, and I think IBD could be a really excellent use case where there's already loads of amazing international work happening that we could prove out within the, the NHS Research SDE network. Um, and we can do that by hopefully leveraging and accelerating existing collaboration that's already going really well. Um, and I'm hoping that those examples will help to shape our data access policy so that it um, far from hinders but um, tangibly helps those international use cases. 
Um, I've mentioned trust and confidence of patients and the public a few times. Um, that's something that I think is more of a unique um, challenge in the UK than it is here in Denmark. So we're really keen, I think, to learn from other countries and, and Denmark very much included around why we might have particular challenges around trust and confidence in use of NHS data or health data for research that other countries don't struggle with so much. And I've mentioned the diameter of trust and there's a little bit of research that shows that population sizes of around 5 million um, are a little bit more achievable to have meaningful conversations with around use of health data but there are many other factors at play and we'd love to have a conversation about that. Um, and then once the sort of research phase is over it's really important that we actually embed innovations in our health systems and we're really keen to continue exchanging knowledge um, for that purpose. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, and with that, I would like to ask all the speakers to join me up here for a joint Q&A session. I think we will, I was going to say, we will use this mic for this purpose, I think. Um, so if anyone in the audience has any questions for our speakers, we'd be happy to take them. Oh, I see Marty. Thank you for going first. <laughs> it's always good to go first, right? Thank you very much um, to all of you for giving your talks. I mean, it's um, very interesting, the different aspects that you bring out. So I'm Marty. I'm a, a senior scientist in the University of Copenhagen, and specifically the Nor Norris Foundation Center for Stem Cell Medicine. Um, and my background is in stem cells, and our interest and our working models are also um, based on stem cells. So I would like to touch upon basically two points that Tina, you mentioned, and Carl as well, um, uh, which comes to this, you identify a number of different genes that are associated with this disease, or let's say variants. Um, and as I understand, you're going to identify more and more as your cohorts increase. And this, I think, highlights the complexity of the disease that we call IBD right now. And then the point that you highlighted, Tina, uh, which is we don't actually know how to model this disease. So therefore, coming from an, let's say, stem cell model and organoid model perspective. Um, and this is not a question, it's sort of like a, maybe a conversation. What are your thoughts on trying to use these novel tools that we have in order to try to model this very complex disease as IBD, um, just to test the functionality of this massive data that you analyze? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So, when we receive biopsies from the clinic, typically what we do is we generate single cell RNA sequencing data from them. What we also do though, is we use the biopsies to generate mucosal organoids. So actually at Sanger, we have a growing bank of mucosal organoids. What, we, what we're doing with those organoids is trying to expose them to different cytokine cocktails to see if we can then follow up with single cell RNA sequencing to see if we can work out the particular cytokine cocktail that gives us a transcriptome that most matches the transcriptome that we saw from the, 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 the kind of inflamed biopsy that we received from, from the patients. So can we work out the particular cytokine cocktails, let's say, or the microbial cocktails that best create in the lab a transcriptome that looks like the tr transcriptomes that we're getting from our IBD patients. It also, um, there's a lot of work going on in, in intestinal mic in the gut microbiome at the moment. And so one of the things we're kind of keeping those organoids for is that should we eventually come up with a list of candidate microbial triggers for IBD, we can then expose our, organ expose our organoids to those and then start again looking at things like uh, the transcriptome but other omic assays in, in the organoids. So yes, we are, we are thinking about organoids and actually trying to work out how we can make them even better models than they already are for, for understanding IBD and how ultimately we can use them for, for screening and um, targeted follow-up if we find particular microbial triggers of interest. Yeah, and maybe I would like to bring it to another level actually, and it's more about the personalized medicine. So we speak a lot about personalized medicine. So the idea that if we know the genetics of a person, then we know the optimal way to treat the person. And we have created a national genome center in Denmark to do exactly this. But in most disease areas, we do not have the evidence for doing personalized medicine. So we do not know 
which genes causes which response to treatment. And so, and, and ideally, or the idea behind personalized medicine, if we were to look at genes only, were that we could test a patient, what is your combination of genes or gene variants, and uh, which drug should you then have. And I think that, of course, this would really be a thing we would love to do. And this is also why we have a National Genome Center that uh, seeks to implement things clinically. But first, you have to create the evidence. And I think we really have resources, both in Denmark and the UK, that can create this evidence. It's not the same as understanding uh, the functionality behind what we see, but it's, it's a matter of understanding the combination of gene variants that may predict disease response, uh, treatment response. Just a further point, you know, once that, once that biobank gets to be a certain size, of course, may, the, 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 there are genotypes in, the, in those individuals. So we will have a large number of patients who carry genetic variants from whom we have organoids. And so we can actually use the organoids um, in a very targeted way, given the particular genetic variants that those individuals carry to explore what is the effect of genotype X or Y or Z on the transcriptome in the organoid. And we can only do that when we get to very large biobanks and we have sufficient numbers of individuals with the organoids and the genetic data. So um, and I think that then also slightly touches on uh, Trina's point about the personalized medicine and kind of combining information around how that patient may have responded to the drug together with the genetic information and then looking at the organoid which you have in hand as your experimental system. Thanks, there's more questions down here. Thank you, thanks, this was fantastic. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. So I'm Danielle Kim, I'm the uh, Strategic Director of Medical Science uh, at the Novo Nordisk Foundation. I have a more of a high level um, question, like especially comparing the UK and Denmark, where it, it strikes me that the UK has invested for a long time in really solid data infrastructures. And uh, I mean, you also, Rebecca, you just m mentioned like some of the initiatives that are that are getting off the ground and you've been connecting the dots for a long time in the UK. Whereas here in Denmark, I mean, we have amazing access or connections, links to, to uh, public health data. And maybe that's a question for you, Trina, like, uh, Tina. Like, what do you think, when we think of the, how we can better use health data and we think about the Danish data infrastructure, what's the, the critical, what are the critical pieces that you think will need to be put in place? to really, is it access? Is it a single access point? Or what, what is it that you think is really critical to, to develop that sector further? Thank you. Thank you for a really good question. <laughs> and it's not an easy one. I would say that, say that what we've been doing the last three years is really to get an understanding of what is needed here, what is needed to actually do this. And, and as I said, it takes many things. If we're just looking at data, dry data per se, then we have GDPR rules. That's one thing. Then we have uh, different, as you know, institutions or uh, organizations having different parts of the data that we would like to unite. Um, then we have the regions that do not use the same uh, uh, medical record systems. Uh, these are all things we need to solve. Um, I don't know about the regions at, and the medical uh, record systems, but, but still I think it's very, very important that we understand how can we unite these things. It's not impossible. It's very difficult. Uh, that's also why we're doing it. Uh, I think it's extremely important that we do it. So I think getting people to collaborate across uh, different organizations with different parts of the data that's key. And of course, also to have a common legal understanding of our GDPR rules, because we do not. So different organizations interpret the rules in different ways. That's a challenge per se. Um, then when we go to the wet data, so to speak, so that we would like to get samples out of our biobanks and analyze them, there's a lot, there's of course a lot of ethical issues around this. And that's also a challenge per se, because ideally we would like our biobank samples to be just as unselected as our health data. Because the uniqueness about our health data is that they cover the entire population. 
it's not only the most severely ill patients seen in a referral center in the US, for example. We cover everyone with a given disease. Ideally, we would do the same with our biobank samples. Um, so to figure out a way uh, to do this, uh, to allow this, and to make people feel certain that this is for everyone's best, and, uh, and that's, that I, I think that often there is a misunderstanding that using biological data, for example, doing genetics on people, is, um, is something that feels like a threat to us. But I don't see it as a threat at all. It's extremely impo important for all of us. We don't know, as Emma said, when we encounter a disease or our closest ones do. So we should all have a common interest in, in contributing to understanding disease development. Um, but I think we have a way to go there as well. And then I agree, it seems as if in the UK uh, there has been much more effort at a much higher level for many, many years working towards this. We have had discussions today that show me that, the, uh, that we still have very granular health data, longitudinal data that are, seem to, I don't know if they are, there is better coverage, but it's easier to get access to these data and combine them with uh, biological data, for example. Uh, so, so there I think we have an advantage, but it is extremely important that we learn from one another. I wonder if I can say, does this mic work or? Um, maybe just a few words about the, the system in, uh, in the UK and my, my main area of expertise is specifically England. That You're right, we, you know, we're working off the backdrop of uh, National Health Service, NHS numbers that make our data intrinsically um, more technically um, straightforward to link and lots of amazing initiatives including things like the HDI UK innovation hubs. However, if you'd read the first few pages of the business case that secured us the £200 million investment only in uh, March 2022, you'd have, the, the system that we have, whilst there are pockets of innovation and pockets of excellence, is incredibly fragmented and isn't meeting the, the needs of the life sciences sector, particularly international. That's why the programme exists. So I think we've made incredible progress thanks to you know, hugely to existing work that, that came before us and the collaboration that we've seen across industry, medical research charities, academia and the NHS in, in the first year. But we're one year into this programme. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities for us to synergistically learn from one another because we're all very much still in that learning phase. I would just add maybe that there's a complementarity here as well. So one of the things is how can we implement what's working there elsewhere what's the right system moving forwards. But you know, having spent a few months here and having worked across some of the sectors, it's, it's clear to me that actually this health dialogue, this exchange can help us realize where we can play to our own strengths with the data that we have and then work together to you know, cross-validate, to replicate, to extend observations and move things forwards. So for example, Carl talked about the power of genetic cohorts. We've heard about the, the data infrastructure in the UK. What Tina's done here in Denmark is truly extraordinary, actually, just given all the, um, the barriers and, and the regulations and things to work through. And one of the things that I've been doing is building new prospective multimodal cohorts. So you can then take a, a very particular group of patients at scale and then answer specific questions moving forward. And some of this T takes time. Um, you know, we need to have one system where you can generate the ideas and then we need to do, you know, PPI so that we can exchange with patients and the public and then actually go and test them. That then takes investment. And then many of these studies, particularly in a chronic illness like inflammatory bowel disease, takes years, you know, four, five, ten years to get really meaningful answers. So it takes cross-sector working, cross-nation working, working with these different um, uh, advantages and, uh, and limitations we have, and then investment, and then some patients, I think, as well. Yeah, just, just to um, add on that, I think I have two microphones on at the minute. <laughs> Very loud. Um, just, just to add to that, I think one of the advantages of the, of the Danish system is that you've essentially been collecting samples for tens and tens of years. And actually, if you think about the, the, the 
timeline that Tina put up there, you have samples from before disease onset. Those are really difficult for us to get our hands on because what tends to happen is you'll have a particular um, group of investigators who are interested in a particular disease and we'll set up a cohort of people perhaps if we're lucky as they're diagnosed it might not even be new disease it might be people with established disease and then we will study that cohort of if we're lucky a few thousand people um, and in the UK this is how our, uh, how our studies have historically um, been undertaken with a group of invested investigators who've then built cohorts of thousands, sometimes tens of thousands for genetics, but it hasn't actually leveraged any of the great things um, that Rebecca was, was talking about. And so what you end up with is a IBD bio resource or a type 1 diabetes um, study or a coronary artery disease cohort, and they're siloed, and they've collected their data independently in a different way. So not only are they not comparable across diseases, there's often another IBD study running within the UK where we've collected completely different IBD data bespoke for that study and so moving towards the study designs of the types that Rebecca and Tina were talking about will allow us to hom homogenize studies and scale them in a way that just isn't practicable when you're thinking about you know a, a study which is very much investigator led where you have to go out and put in those years of hard work to establish cohort X and cohort Y and cohort Z which then isn't even comparable so I think that's really key, and the great advantage that is here in Denmark is this access to these um, samples which were historically collected long before the onset of IBD. And so actually if you can, if you can free it up so that people like uh, Atina can access those samples and generate data on them, and you put that alongside the longitudinal phenotype information, then actually the ability to get unique insights into disease is very profound because most disease studies happen on people who already have a disease and we have no insight into what was going on with them in the 10, 10 20, 30, 40 years before that disease happened. And if you can then help me <laughs> being able to send <laughs> my samples to Carl so that he can examine them, that would be awesome because that's really a challenge we have in Denmark as well, if not across Europe in general. Uh, and um, the fact that we are now, especially after some cases in Denmark, really, really afraid of sending our samples anywhere. And it's, it's really a pity because if you have people in the UK who know how to handle these samples better than anyone else, then why, why should, if we decide, do, if we are permitted to do analysis, do research on these samples, well then let's analyze them in the best manner possible. And that's very, very difficult right now. So it's a great point, Tina. You know, when you were outlining the, the goals of, of your center, I was sat there thinking, yes, those are my goals too. And I know those are Charlie's goals, and they're the goals of everybody who's doing research in, research in IBD. And what ends up happening is because we can't share data, we end up competing against each other and we don't want to compete against each other what we want to do is to share our data and more and that will allow us to amass sufficient sample sizes more rapidly to make discoveries more rapidly rather than having to to compete with each other when you know the world does not want eight nine ten different um, genetic, small genetic studies. What it wants is one big genetic study which is done well using data from multiple different countries where we can understand better genetic variation and um, how it impacts IBD across different populations. That's ultimately what, what we want, but we're almost forced to compete um, because of an inability to, to, to share data quickly and rapidly. I think, I think you asked what, what do you need to do? And when I'm having conversations with, with stakeholders around the data for R&D program, the, I'm often told the, the technical stuff is easy. I mean, I don't think it looks that easy, but apparently the technical stuff is easy. Um, and I think it's really true that what we need is political will that turns into action. That action has to be the availability of funding and the availability of time. And then information governance policy and legislation that enables research rather than hinders it. I don't think we have have that right in the UK right now. And if we're going to have information governance policy and legislation that enables research using data, we have to have engagement with our patients, public and communities, so that we can make sure that we transition to a place where we're enabling research in a way that isn't then scuppered by our inability to kind of gain and maintain that confidence and engagement with patients and the public. Mm -hmm. 
is then would it make more sense to invest then in the like strengthening the infrastructure of um, facilitating access of existing data rather than creating new cohorts now that's the question so well yeah i put just put it out there i will maybe uh, allow who like to tag on a question because he's been waiting patiently and then you can answer that uh, together just so i don't run back and forth all the time <laughs> yeah so my name is ulrich Lickenberg. i work for the same organization actually with ai data science health data and it's along the same lines that i thought it was very interesting rebecca in, in your presentation that you have this geographically segmented strategy where there are sort of local projects and they're geographically defined. They're not defined by subtopics like IBD or diabetes. Uh, and you also talked about the difference between actually moving or copying the data onto a common platform, maybe one big UK server with everything on it, as opposed to building federated systems where you sort of call up, but the, the data stays with whoever generated it. So could you comment a little bit on, because as you say, technically moving data is not so complicated. And, and uh, if you were a corporation uh, that, uh, like a retailer that sells TVs, then rolling out the same IT system with everyone or having one big central one that would enable you to, uh, to go into one city in the UK with a TV you bought in another city and then you could uh, get your money back or whatnot. That is not technically complicated. So there probably are some incentives underneath that make this complicated and they are not technical. They, they probably have to do with something else. So could you comment on, on what is the resistance? Why is it geographically defined as opposed to uh, just building one big system? not one SDE to rule them all. Um, and a big part of that is that we are not starting in a greenfields environment. We're, we're building off of infrastructure investments that already exist, have already taken us a long way. So the National NHS England Secure Data Environment already exists. It's operating as a minimum viable product and our objective is to build up the capacity and capability. And we recognise that we have a time-limited window of opportunity to capitalise on the momentum that we got during the COVID-19 acute pandemic phase and to, to make the UK competitive on a global stage when it comes to life sciences. So if we had um, seven years where we could squirrel away and develop one platform as a kind of greenfield brand new thing without having to enable research in the meantime that might be the approach that we would take but that's not the situation we're in we need to be enabling research right now for the whole duration of the program and continue to scale it up and out which is why we're focusing on having that national secure data environment that can provide the coverage and the access to the curated data but also investing in these sub-national secure data environments and you mentioned that we're not going down the disease specific route and that's because we don't want to cr create siloed kind of thematic cohorts that can only do cancer or only do IBD. We want to have a core offering across all of our assets that can um, underpin all types of research and then where there are specific assets whether that's expertise or the HDI UK innovation hubs that they can specialize over and above that whether that's a particular modality, imaging, or a particular disease, IBD. So we're going to see that taxonomy across the ecosystem start to come out. Um, and the way that we established the 11 teams that were funding across um, all of England was there were quite a few factors in there that I won't take up the whole of the rest of the time talking about, but it was driven not just by geographical boundaries. It was where are the existing research collaborations? Where are the existing infrastructure investments, including things like shared care record teams? What's the EHR readiness like? And how do we cover populations that are going to be meaningful across all of our use cases? And where can we have local connectivity to clinical teams to translate research into innovation in practice and connectivity to our local communities. So all of those things have historical roots that are geographically based, which is why we have a map with borders on it. Um, but it was um, derived by much more multifaceted factors that relate to enabling research. 
So I think what that does is very neatly answers your question and, and the bid around facilitating, investing in facilitating access to the existing data that's there. But the question before that was, do you invest there or do you invest in generating new cohorts? And I think the answer is clearly you need to do both. As Carl said before, with these existing data, you can get at these really amazing questions with samples collected before disease onset. Um, with new cohorts, it takes time and it takes investment. But a lot of what we're doing now is based on new cohorts that were generated at some point. You look at the legacy of some of the UK birth cohorts, the Danish national birth cohort, and we haven't really talked about that today, but a lot of the data that we are leveraging within these national registries are from some of these very specific cohorts that were set up with a vision, with funding, with dedication, and with that public and um, patient and community partnerships going back you know, the, the original UK birth cohorts were in, I think, the 1930s, um, and the Danish national birth cohort that's now 25 years old. So I think we have to take a responsibility to do that because these take time as well. And so if we don't start generating new cohorts now, which have the data inputs that we now know we want to get, because we're limited when you look at the existing cohorts by the data that was inputted at the start and what infrastructure was put in moving forwards. And the final point, I think, is that I do strongly believe that we have a sort of ethical and moral responsibility to do that, not in Denmark and in the UK alone, but globally, yeah. right? We here have the knowledge, we have the infrastructure, we have at least some of the finance to make this happen. If you look at what's going on in sub-Saharan Africa, there is a huge brain drain of qualified healthcare professionals, scientists, um, tech people, um, to, to, to name just a few sectors, coming to Denmark, coming to the UK to earn better salaries. And if we can help um, you know, work with them and with people in um, their, uh, you know, out in Africa and, 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 and in Asia and South America, I, th I think that, that to generate new cohorts to work with existing data sets, I think that's a really, uh, you know, morally, moral imperative that we have. I think that's a, re a really great point, Charlie. And I think if we look historically at these kind of bespoke cohort studies that we've been working on, what we've found is that it's difficult to get funding to support infrastructure to set up these studies. Once they're set up and you've collected tens of thousands of DNA samples, or you've got that biobank of organoids, or you've got the tissue samples, then all of a sudden there's a whole host of people who are very interested in funding you to generate molecular assays on that data. Once you've shown that the samples are there and the phenotypic data is there, but actually it's really difficult to get the funding to, to create these cohorts to begin with. And so if I, if I think back historically in the UK, it has been funders such as the, the MRC and the Wellcome Trust who have funded those big infrastructure projects rather than pharma companies who quite often are much more willing to come in and drop a significant amount of cash, whole exome sequencing your half a million people in UK biobank because the turnaround times for them generating that data and them getting benefit from it are greater than the turnaround times it would have been if they had dropped a similar amount of cash to set up the cohort in the first place. So I think, what should we fund? It depends who you are as a funder, because actually there are some data sets and data types which are easy to fund where one means that aren't by another. So I think if you're thinking about as a, as a kind of national scientific funding agency what can you support? Then I would say actually investing in infrastructure and creating the data structures and the data access that, that Rebecca and Tina have talked about is probably a greater priority than you, for you than it might be to say fund the generation of the exome sequencing that I was talking about earlier because I think once you've done your bit, other people will step up to do their bit. I think to answer uh, your question about federated data analyses versus uh, one single setup. I think we just need to accept federated as the way forward. I think there's no other way we can get around it. Even if um, Rebecca had the will and was somehow successful to create an entity within the UK that could have all the data, we want to collaborate with Tina. 
We now can't take the Denmark data and put it on the UK server. We're not going to be able to do that. So at some point you're federated, whether you're federated within your country or whether you're federated across countries. And so I think we need to get used to this idea of federated working and make sure that we have the, the, the computational IT infrastructure as well as the kind of fancy statistical methods that allow us to work on these federated data sets. And I just think this idea that big data doesn't move, that yes, we could move it, but actually, ultimately, we want to be working across many different data sets around the world, and nobody wants to move all that data. So I think federated has to be the way forward. And just a last quick comment. I think in Denmark, we are uniquely positioned to actually make one common infrastructure for research. This is actually what we are showing already with PREDICT. Yeah, we use IBD as a use case, but what we are doing can be applied to any disease and actually what, within the very framework that we are doing it. Thank you all so much. And uh, I'm sorry to break up the discussion. I hope that you will continue it with us during the networking session outside. Thank you so much to all the speakers and thank you to all of you for joining us today and for the online audience. This is the end of the live stream. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.